Welcome to the Agents of Innovation podcast, where we feature conversations with entrepreneurs, philanthropists, and artists. Okay, well, we are here at the Universidad Francisco Marroquin in Guatemala City. Uh, I've had the pleasure of being able to teach as a visiting professor here for uh, basically the last year. I've taught three semesters of a class on entrepreneurship and innovation, mostly thanks to the great people here, including Monica Zelaya, who I get to interview. She's the dean of the School of Economic Sciences here at UFM, also a graduate of UFM. Uh, Monica, thanks for joining me on the Agents of Innovation podcast. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very glad to share with you this moment. Well, I'm, I'm just so thankful uh, for the invitation to be able to teach here at such a wonderful university. I, I actually was just, you know, like I said, I've been here about a year now, and I was just texting some friends yesterday. They said, how has it been going? I said, uh, I walk around this campus almost every day, even after a year, uh, not believing that it actually exists. <laughs> that this is such an incredible place, a monument to free markets and liberty and just the intellectual traditions that are cherished here. You know, people like F.A. Hayek and Milton Friedman and Ludwig von Mises and so many other free market economists that are actually taught here. But it's not just that you have this free market tradition here. You have really an open uh, mindset of inquiry and, you know, I guess you could say free speech to some degree, you know, a lot of things that are missing in a lot of universities in the United States right now, which is supposed to be, you know, the most free and prosperous country in the world. And, uh, and a lot of times we are missing a lot of the freedoms to express ourselves there. Uh, but also you don't just have, uh, you know, some of the traditional uh, liberal arts and economics type of degrees here. You also have a, you know, in addition to a business school, you have a law school, mm -hmm. a medical school, a dental school, a film school. So it's really incredible. And the caliber of the students here is amazing uh, here in Guatemala. So a real testament to the work that you and many other people have done for many years here at UFM. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. We really love UFM. We believe in the principles we teach. And uh, I think it's very important to remember that the university was founded with the mission of teaching the economic, legal, and ethical principles of a society of free and responsible persons. So even though it's the mission that is written, we really believe it and we live through those principles every day. Yeah, what's interesting, uh, you said the legal... Ethical. Ethical. And economic. And economic. Principle. But what's really interesting to me about that is the ethical. Mm -hmm. T can you tell me a little bit more about the ethical uh, element of, of what UFM uh, believes? Well, we think that when we talk about freedom, we need to talk about ethics. So, I mean, uh, freedom without principles or freedom without ethics could be dangerous. So we know that to preserve freedom in the long term, we need to be ethical in everything we do. So it's very important. And the reason that we mention ethical, legal, and economic principles is that we understand that in society, in order to build up a good future, we need the legal and the economic principles alive. So that's what the, why the, or the university started with these two schools, the School of Economics and the School of Law. Those were the first two schools that were founded at UFM because of the need in society of lawyers, economics, I mean economic graduates and business people that understand freedom and that understand how important it is for growth, development, we creating wealth. Yeah, so that's interesting. So let's go back in history a little bit. Mm -hmm. 1971 mm -hmm. is when uh, UFM was founded by a man named Manuel Agao, mm -hmm. uh, who many just refer to as his, I guess, his nickname, Musso. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And mm -hmm. he was, uh, do you, can you tell us a little bit about the man he was mm -hmm. and what his mission was and why he started a university? Mm -hmm. That's a very, very interesting story. And we can take <laughs> several podcasts to yes. talk about <laughs> Musso and his friends. And I think it, what it's interesting is he was young. He was just graduating from the university, and when he came back to Guatemala, he, he saw around and saw a lot of barefoot people walking in the streets. So he was asking himself, why in the 20th century is so many people that is barefoot? So he started asking himself, how can we change this? I mean, we cannot continue uh, ignoring poverty. So we need to understand what society needs to do in order to 
reduce poverty and create wealth. So that's the way they started. So they started with conversations between them and they were thinking of projects that they can do as young people to impact the future of the country or even more than the country. So that's the way this started. That's why I think entrepreneurship is so connected with UFM. It's not a trendy topic. It is because we have always been connected with entrepreneurship since the founders. So they started to think, and they have several projects in mind. They even thought about a political party, a newspaper. But then they thought, if we really wa want to make a change in the long term, we need to go through education. And they decided then to found UFM. And they found uh, UFM with a lot of... Um, auto-learning, I mean self-learning processes of discovering these authors like Mises and Hayek and, and then traveling to talk to people in the U.S. that were in these institutions, understanding how important was freedom. And that was the path. And fast forward 50 years after, this is our beautiful campus. They started in a very small house, a little far away from here, like an, a kilometer away. And then, I mean, things just start to happen. And as you have read, we cannot connect the points or the dots looking forward, but looking backward. So now we connect lots of things that have happened through the years that has brought UFM to what it is today. And you mentioned the campus. Uh, this campus opened in the early 1980s, so about 10 or 12 years after the university was founded. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, it was maybe uh, a couple of dozen students mm -hmm. the first few years, you know, little... Uh, house basically yeah actually it just have two classrooms the bathrooms <laughs> and a little patio where I mean garden where, where, where people share and the, the offices it was very small I started studying there and finished here so I was in the moment that they moved towards this campus but I think what you feel in the campus while you walk here is you really feel this sense of freedom and you said how important freedom it is for us and the principles of freedom in the classes, I mean the openness to explore new perspectives, questions from students. I mean the questions, the role of questions are so important. We always say that university started with a question, why we are poor. And yeah. I think that started the whole project that very entrepreneurially moved forward with lots of passion and great intentions and action towards what we are today and today's campus is like you said and it's in a beautiful environment um you could see a little bit behind us here if you're watching this um with the green uh it just it, it really does feel like you're in like a little oasis we're in zone 10 in guatemala <laughs> in city, city which is really yeah in <laughs> the middle right. it's a very commercial mm -hmm. kind of part of the city mm -hmm. a very vibrant part of the city but when i'm here on campus mm -hmm. i feel like i could be in, in another place mm -hmm. and um you really don't see the outside of the city too much mm -hmm. it's a lot of green a lot of and it's also nice how the architecture here mm -hmm. blends with the nature. And actually, it was a ravine. I mean, the, the, yeah. this, this place was a ravine. And someone says that when Muso came, he was looking where to move the campus. And he came to the ravine and just see, I mean, saw this beautiful place. And he said, this is the place. And everybody said, we will not have the money <laughs> to buy this. We'll find it. <laughs> we'll know how to do it. And that's the way entrepreneurs think. So if anyone here in the podcast is, is an entrepreneur or have a, a, an entrepreneurial project or endeavor, just, I mean, keep, keep dreaming, keep acting towards that dream and keep moving forward. Because, I mean, this is a reality that we can see. How real can it become? <laughs> the other aspect of the founding of UFM, I think I, I feel like has to uh, be talked about because a lot of people, especially outside Guatemala, may not understand the context. Mm -hmm. Uh, Guatemala was enveloped in a, a civil war, basically, between the 1960s and the 1990s. Uh, also, uh, the world was enraptured in a Cold War. So we had the Cold War context. So starting a university like this, and also the other thing, uh, a lot of people outside Guatemala may not realize, I didn't know until I started learning more about the founding of UFM, was, uh, especially at that time, there was a very closed system for private universities to start. I think there was only a handful of private universities. And when somebody like Musso came along and said, I want to start another private university, people started questioning why, or, you know, no, <laughs> you know, or right. Like, so, uh, uh, and, and then again, to be able to be brave enough to start something that like this kind of a university that was very entrepreneurial minded, free market focused in the context of the cold war, in the context of a civil war, 
um, there was definitely people here that were um, hostile to the ideas that, that UFM. So uh, can you talk a little bit about that kind of context of that UFM started well, in and, and maybe it, how it was like as a student mm -hmm. in, I guess, the 70s and 80s or so to come here? Uh -huh. Well, I was not here in the 70s. Oh, you mentioned the other... <laughs> At the end of the 80s. <laughs> yeah, the but, I mean, what I have heard and even read, last year we, we got this great number of readings of some of the notes of Musso from the first days of his dream. And it, it, it is so interesting to read, I mean, his, his thoughts. And one of the th things I, I read that I remember very well is he, he was so worried about younger generations. And he said, I'm so worried that they won't learn about freedom principles and how important it is for society and for building up real prosperity. So he was worried, authentically worried for that. And he said, I, I think that in Guatemala, we don't have that many options. And uh, mainly the big, biggest university was the public university, which they do not teach these type of principles. So he said, how, how people in Guatemala, young people will discover about these principles and how important they are for society. So he, he felt responsible to look forward to open this opportunity for other persons in the country to get educated on these principles. And the other thing is he pushed for competition in the university sector. I mean, he, he pushed as much as he can to open up the possibility of creating new private universities in Guatemala. So one of the first fights he had is to open up the possibility for, to have more universities because he thought, I mean, that will help in the quality, compet as competition always does, uh, the quality and options and also, I mean, to have uh, many different ways uh, to, to get educated on the college level. And uh, so I think that was one of the many things he has done uh, for Guatemala, pushing for small changes in laws or in procedures or conditions that can open up for competition and increase options for persons that want to, I mean, move forward in, in any of these fields. So you mentioned, uh, you know, we talked about the entrepreneurial mindset mm -hmm. that uh, UFM is, is trying to build here mm -hmm. among its students and ultimately for Guatemala. Mm -hmm. um, and you helped in a lot of these elements. Uh, obviously, you're now the dean of the School of Economic Sciences. Mm -hmm. um, but even before that, you helped found the Kersner Entrepreneurship Center, through which I've been teaching my classes now, so I'm glad that you started this uh, entrepreneurship <laughs> center, uh, named for uh, the economist Israel Kersner. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. you also lead the Global Entrepreneurship uh, Monitor Research for Guatemala, and you um, developed a, a concept called the ripple effects of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about um, maybe just the what UFM is doing, what the Kersner Entrepreneurship Center does, mm -hmm. and how you try to you know, help inspire students towards uh, being entrepreneurs? Uh, great. Well, I, I'm in love with the concept of entrepreneurship and how important it is to connect it with freedom. I mean, without freedom, it's difficult to be entrepreneurial, even though we see in countries where freedom is limited that people in their individual action find ways to be entrepreneurial, the, the, same, the same challenge. I mean, they, they have to move forward and to um, actually uh, act entrepreneurially in anything they have. But regarding the university, one of the things that I would say is, um, first of all, we walk the talk. I mean, the university works as an entrepreneurial institution. That's very awkward to be seen in other universities. So the university has different departments. Each department is a school. And it is pretty much decentralized. So each of the, the, the teams, uh, for example, I'm the dean of the School of Economics, but I, I have a great team in the, in the school. And we find different opportunities that we can help students to be better every day. So the commitment to excellence, the commitment to be the, the best that we can, the commitment to open opportunities for students in the field that we are teaching all over the world, not just in Guatemala, bringing great professors like yourself, or opening opportunities for them to go away and have the opportunity to be there, or um, starting projects, like real projects where they can do hands-on things that where they can apply what they are learning. I mean, that's what we do every day. What I like is that you really feel that sense of trust from the board of the university in you as the leader of a department, for example. And then this replicates in, I mean, the, the members of the staff and the teachers. You as a teacher may have felt this freedom of, okay, we understand you are very good in this, 
how would we centralize exactly what we want you to teach? I mean, we find the best in the field and then give you freedom so you can really share with the students the best that you can. So I think that is one of the characteristics of UFM. And that's how we started all these programs that you have read. I mean, whenever we see the opportunity of okay in the region, there's no entrepreneurial center. So why don't we start uh, an entrepreneurship center based in the ideas of freedom? And we thought Kirchner to be like the father of this initiative and he was, uh, he agreed to be, uh, t that we could name the center under his name. And um, to know that creating the center was a way of acting in three different ways, education, research, and connections because we understand that entrepreneurship is about connections so we can help to create lots of connections for different people in guatemala or in the region so that's why we started and actually the purpose was to promote entrepreneurship as much as we can and to understand how important is freedom in the entrepreneurial action and we have seen that entrepreneurs understand very well the relevance of freedom and that's how we how we started many of the other projects if you want me to go deeper in each one of them i can i can but i don't want to take the minutes that you yeah have no this people. has all been great monica and a couple of things i want to comment on that you said just uh, some of it is observation uh first of all you you mentioned israel kersner uh you know the entrepreneurship center named after him one thing i find really interesting here is there are some spaces here very small and subtle where I've seen names of donors, like on a door or something like that, very, very small. Mm -hmm. Hmm. But in the United States, most of the universities, the buildings mm -hmm. are named for donors. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't miss it. Here, I feel like all the major naming opportunities that maybe a university in the U.S. might sell, you know, in a sense, or, or recognize a donor that gave like a really big gift, mm -hmm. uh, those are not those are not named for donors here. Those are named for the kind of people UFM emulates. So the library here is named after von Mises. Mm -hmm. We have auditoriums by, named for Milton Friedman and F.A. Hayek. Right not too far behind us here is the Adam Smith Plaza, right? Uh, uh, there's the, you know, Manuel Yao Garden. This terrace is the Rose Friedman yeah. Terrace. <laughs> <laughs> We're on the Rose Friedman Terrace, right? And, and most of the people that are named after, these people are no longer with us. Mm -hmm. Maybe at some point they were during uh, the time they were named. I'm not sure. Uh, but, you know, what that's, it just seems really interesting to me that uh, you're really teaching students everywhere. So I just named some of the major big naming things. Mm -hmm. uh, not too far uh, from here in the academic building, as you kind of walk a little area, there's almost like a genealogy of, eco of, of economist mm -hmm. that there must be 20 to 50 at least that's right. names and pictures and the dates and maybe a little line about them. Um, mm -hmm. And I just feel like it's a very kind of somewhat subtle, mm -hmm. but somewhat not subtle, uh, uh, teaching opportunities for students that are kind of reinforced. Also, there's a lot of quotes around the campus mm -hmm. um, of just mm -hmm. things that are, that are not like, um, you know, let's say uh, political type, type or, or, or economic, but they're more like just very gen generic, like maybe uh, quotes from some of the Stoics, right? Mm -hmm. Or something like, uh, and I'm thinking about the Cato walkway mm -hmm. over there. And Ryan Rand of down here, yeah. like the Atlas. Right, the Atlas yeah. Shrug uh, bronze sculpture there. I mean, just so many things, so many great quotes, uh, so many ways to kind of uplift mm -hmm. students in their thinking. Mm -hmm. And also uh, the campus itself, there's a lot of great places to just sit back and study among nature. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, the other thing, uh, people outside Guatemala might not realize, this is the eternal spring here. <laughs> yeah, the it's country of the eternal <laughs> spring. That's the name, the way we name the country. With, regarding of what you were saying is, I think that all these details mm -hmm. along the, the whole campus is a way to remember the commitment we have with the, teach, the principles we teach. I mean, it's, it's there and it's visible for everybody that we are committed to those principles all the time and we want everybody that comes to the campus the students the teachers any guest or visitor to know how important it is for us those principles and values the freedom principles and the things that we be really believe in and the second thing that i would mention regarding donors which is very interesting is the university just receives donations from private donations i mean just private donations we do not receive any public donation 
any donation from the government or international organizations or we do not receive, even though we have had proposals. I mean, they come here, we have good projects. For example, in the Entrepreneurship Center, we have great projects going on, impacting different targets of people in the in the country that cannot come to the university, that, but we can share with them some of the things we know. And um, we have proposals of these kind of organizations, and we always are very clear since the beginning, we do not accept any of this funding because it won't be a good example of what we really believe in. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one way of showing how committed we are with those principles. The other thing I find interesting, and this is kind of something I learned being uh, a visiting professor here, is each of the departments, they have their own budgets. Mm -hmm. And there's also sort of a, I don't know how to best explain this, but an interworking. So if you, so each department has to reserve certain classrooms for mm -hmm. teachers and has to literally purchase the yep. space, right? That's right. <laughs> and, and so if you want to uh, reserve a room for a class or something special, or maybe... Um, the auditorium, Yeah, the aud we have a lecture. Yeah, we pay for that. Yeah. I mean, we have prices, and even though, uh, I mean, uh, all of these classes are in the campus, they do not have the same price. Yeah. I mean, they are priced because of demand, which is very interesting. I think not even students know this. So this is really, really a way of showing uh, how... Um, market principles um, rule in everything yeah. we do administrating the campus. And it might be that a certain room is uh, is, is a higher price because it's more in demand that's or right. it could be a certain time period yeah, to hold a right. class. The schedule. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. The other thing I find interesting, um, I see this a lot particularly in the business school and I'm, I'm sure it exists in other schools, uh, but you have a lot of business people, entrepreneurs in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe people running companies all, that come here and teach as a visiting professor. Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of times, I, uh, I by the way, I've been living <laughs> in the neighborhood right behind UFM for the last four or five months. Mm -hmm. And I love to take morning walks through mm -hmm. here, usually at like seven in the morning. And I see all these students <laughs> at seven in the morning on campus. And, um, and uh, where, where, what are they doing here? Well, I, I've also learned that a lot of the classes they take at seven in the morning are from a lot of these CEOs, yeah. business people that are, they teach a class from 7 to 8.30 and then they go off to their job. So it shows you that the commitment they have mm -hmm. to trying to instill in the next generation mm -hmm. some of the principles they've learned in their own business. Absolutely. Let me, let me explain you a little bit about that. I mean, one of the ways we really put in practice this uh, commitment to excellence is the academic rigor. I mean, the, the, and it repre it's represented in the classes, in the way that teachers just um, demand from students, students their best effort, and in the profile of students and teachers. I mean, so to be part of UFM, you really need to show that you are committed to do the things that have to be done. Uh, the process of admission, the admission process for the students, uh, it's tough. I mean, we have the toughest admission process of in the region and uh, for the different schools or faculties. I mean, they ask for different things, but uh, then to be a teacher, I, we, we need a combination of elements that we have to see in the teacher and that he really wants to uh, get engaged on this learning process. It's not how he teaches, it's the way he opens up the possibility for the students to learn, how he motivates them, how he shares his knowledge, his experience, his talent. I mean, that's the most important thing that we need to do. So we're very, very selective. You're feeling proud <laughs> that you're part of our... <laughs> yes, yes. No, I mean, we're, we're all the time trying to look for, for professors. And what you said is right. I mean, at 7 a.m. or 1 p.m., we have a lot of these very high-level executives or business people that make time in their very, very busy schedule to come to UFM and share this time with students, teaching what they know to do. And, uh, I mean, we cannot pay them what they are valued for, even though we are the university that pays the highest. But but I I think it's because they get connected with the passion that students transmit, and it's a very special moment. This moment of discovering and discussing and just um, getting connected on building up ideas and projects for the future, I think that's marvelous. And that's what keeps this profile of, of persons connected with the university. Well, you also mentioned you know the rigor that the students must have to come here. I know that uh, my understanding is that UFM is also one of the more expensive, maybe the most expensive mm -hmm. university in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. I will say, as I kind of meet people around 
uh, Guatemala City and other parts of the country. If I mention that I'm a visiting professor at UFM, oh man, uh, my uh, my respect level goes way up, uh, and I gain a lot more attention. And it's like a curiosity. Wait, what? What are you doing there? Um, but everybody always has. It doesn't really matter if I'm talking to an mm-hmm. Uber driver, or you know, a business person, or whoever you know, a CEO, whatever. Um, I always hear such a level of respect for UFM. Mm -hmm. I think even a lot of, probably most people in this country couldn't afford to go here or send their children Mm -hmm. here, but they have a level of respect for it. Mm -hmm. Um, With that being said, there is also a scholarship program here mm-hmm. that I think you helped develop, the ETA program. Can mm-hmm. you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. I love the ETA program. Let me tell you first what you just said. The university, since the first days, Muso as part, and, and, their, and his team decided this. I mean, we will be the toughest to get in, the toughest to graduate, the trof- toughest to stay in. So they asked for a GPA along all the different programs during all the years of your career. And, and the, the most expensive and the most demanding in time. So, I mean, this was the concept, which has one purpose and is to attract the best talent. If a person is very talented, he wants to come to a university that would ask him to do his best. And that's, I think, the case of UFM. And can, and can and you talk a little ITA bit about program. that ITA program? Yes, yeah. I mean, the ITA program, and I think this is very interesting because the, the program started in 1996, 1996. We have graduated already 250 students. The program is very interesting because what we try to do is to invite students from all the country, and now we also have from other countries, and we ask them um, if, I mean, to do a, the same process as any, any other student that is applying. And they really fight for, for the scholarships. We have a small number of scholarships. We, we would love to have more, but it's a expensive scholarship. And what we found is there are people in the country that are so, so talented. They have just had the opportunity to go, for example, for a public school, an elementary and a high school, very far away from the city. Uh, many of them are um, from parents that ha- were illiterate, or even orphans. I mean, it's it's a, they are amazing stories. And uh, when they have one opportunity, one opportunity in their lives to use their talent and commit to excellence, what we can can see in them, it's amazing. I mean, the level of the class rises with them because they are great. They they make great questions. They come prepared to class. They do whatever they can to take advantage of 100% of what is happening at UFM or in the classes. So I think that um, we normally see three characteristics in them. I mean, they have to be talented. I mean, uh, I mean, dedicated, talented, edu- ed- dedicated, and uh, disciplined. I mean, th- along the, the the school years. And the third one is the leadership potential, because many of them almost all of them, go back in one way or the other to their communities and they are leaders of the community, inspire younger people to keep moving forward in their own education, to find other scholarship programs or to come here and, I mean, have the opportunity to apply to the program. So they are absolutely amazing people. Um, I can have another podcast completely. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Well, I've I've interacted with some of the ETAS students. Uh, They are uh, some incredible students. Some have uh, actually become involved with my community fearless journeys which cool. i think is great um right. and so it's uh but it's been really great because i i really they're really i mean all the all the things that you just mentioned all the characteristics are totally instilled in them um and it's it's exciting to see that ufm is part of that but how excited they are to be here on this campus and also how other students here who are um, you know, who didn't need the ETA scholarship, uh, embrace them so much mm-hmm. as well. And, and I mean, they have seemed to me some of the most, uh, not to diminish all the other students here, but some of the, some of the most talented students and hardworking and well-educated. The other thing I should say about the general student population mm-hmm. here, I think that UFM has a requirement that when students graduate here, they must be proficient in English mm-hmm. as well. Um, however, my, uh, I, obviously, I'm not fluent in Spanish, uh-huh. <laughs> um, and I teach my classes in English, mm-hmm. and the students understand when they take my class, it's going to be taught in English, and they'll be expected to converse and communicate in English. Uh, they're all great in English. Some of them uh, maybe are not uh, believing as much that they are, but I said, no, your <laughs> English is great. But I think a lot of them actually come into UFM with a proficiency in English. Mm-hmm. Maybe you can 
mention that yes a bit. i think i mean uh, one of the uh, characteristics of ufm is we are very international yeah and uh, i know that many universities say they are but they aren't I mean, the university it really is very international. We have a lot of visiting professors. We have a lot of projects going on all along the year. And uh, many of this is connected with other countries. And that's why when you said UFM is very special, because it has been like a lighthouse in freedom um, teaching or education in many places of the world, not just in Guatemala. And... Um, Uh, one professor said once, uh, we are a big fish in a small pond. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I think that's, that's true. And uh, so to open up this opportunity for students, our graduates, uh, they need to be prepared in other languages. Yeah. So they can take advantage of many opportunities. For example, in the School of Economics, we have a program that we named the Global Program. With the Global Program, you can be in UFM Guatemala, you can go to UFM Madrid for a year, and then take one or two more territories with any of the uh, alliances that we have with other universities, or, or if you have one new one, we will take it and move forward with that, that opportunity. So students have these great international um, experiences that enrich their learning process. For example, we have uh, not just the study abroad that many universities have, but also like internships uh, internationally, uh, small practices, small seminars. And one more thing that I would mention is study tours that are very special. For example, we do a study tour since some years ago to Silicon Valley. But the interesting thing is we really get in the most important companies and we talk with very high level uh, managers so they can share with them what what are their challenges what what is important now for them some of the trends in the industry and in some cases uh, we talk with the entrepreneurs or the founders of these organizations those type of opportunities are so important it's, it's like eye-opening for yeah. anyone i i go to any of this that i can because <laughs> i mean for me it's like these are reloaded <laughs> yeah ufm <laughs> offers <laughs> its students so many opportunities so you mentioned madrid uh there's now a madrid campus mm -hmm. opened a couple years ago i know through this COVID time it's kind of you know we haven't probably seen it fully blossom yet mm -hmm. uh, but now it's 2022 and it's starting to to really mm -hmm. do that and um And then also, I think there's an MBA program in Panama. In Panama, very active and also a very interesting profile of the students. I have met many of them and it's very interesting, their profile, yeah. And then, of course, you mentioned internationally. Well, uh, UFM some years ago started the Antigua Forum, mm -hmm. which you were president of the Antigua Forum in 2015. It is known as the Freedom Accelerator, a process of innovation and entrepreneurship for reformers. I was very honored to be able to be a part of it this year for mm -hmm. the first time. And I was just blown away. People come there with projects. I think there was about nine or 10 projects this year. Mm -hmm. And then there's another maybe 40 or 50 of us mm -hmm. that are there to observe, give feedback. We can move in this garden area uh, mm -hmm. where this was done uh, in Antigua at, the, at Casa Popano. Um, and we could kind of just sit there for five minutes or sit there for two hours, you know, <laughs> and move to another project as we, as we want, give some feedback, a lot of different perspectives offered. It was really an amazing experience. Tell me, um, maybe you can explain Antigua Forum a little bit more for us huh. and your involvement in it. Well, I think Antigua Forum is one of the most interesting events that are happening in the world. I mean, it is absolutely amazing. I'm in love with entrepreneurship and innovation, and I have been in many different type of events in different parts of the world. And uh, Antigua Forum is like the permanent coffee break. <laughs> uh, normally yeah. we say that when you go to any of these activities, the most interesting conversations are happening in the coffee break. And you want the coffee break to continue and not to go back to like very static uh, lectures, uh, I mean, type of this, um, this, this type of seminars or things like that. So the Antigua Forum has this purpose and the purpose is accelerate freedom through original and entrepreneurial projects real projects that we really want them to be launched and to grow. Uh, if anyone of you can go to the Antigua Forum uh, website and can see the projects, they are absolutely amazing. Normally, they are projects that have impact in society. Uh, it's not like a typical uh, pitch of a business, even though many of them are businesses. They're concerned or focused on, on very uh, important um, social challenges, I would say. Mm -hmm. So some of them are re regarding to health or education or uh, freedom or uh, regulation or openness of uh, trade in a country or things like this. What, what is one of the most interesting things? The projects are 
from many different countries of the world. For example, this year we had one from Cameroon and one from uh, Israel and one from, so they're from many different places in the world. And second, I mean, the persons that come, it's a mix of reformers, entrepreneurs, innovators, and people that really understand about these specific challenges. So we have like innovation stations. And these, these innovation stations work with a very specific process that we name the co-creation process. And that's what, what it happens. We co-create together something that can really help this idea that was pitched uh, towards a very different level to expand or to replicate or to be launched. It is amazing. So we have done it for 11 years already. This, this year was the 11th. And uh, I cannot miss this amazing thing. And I have been their president in 2015, and I have been in all of them <laughs> as a facilitator uh, of one of the stations. So I have seen born many of these ideas in my own station, and they are all amazing. Yeah, it's great. And and you were a facilitator. Some, uh, some of the other facilitators included UFM graduates, UFM students, mm -hmm. Um, you can see there's there's here at UFM, and we don't have to get totally into this. I think maybe we'll have some other conversations with some other folks, but there's a place uh, here called the CoLab, mm -hmm. which really is kind of brief for collaboration. Mm -hmm. What's really, and they kind of do these sorts of things with students mm -hmm. um, in this interactive collaborative process. What I loved about being an Antigua Forum, I said, yes, this is exactly what I've been trying to teach to my students mm -hmm. in terms of how innovation works. Mm -hmm. And you need, you know, other people, nobody, Nobody innovates alone, mm -hmm. right? And as soon as you, these people, and what's really interesting, these people came there with these projects that they've dedicated their lives to. Some of them have been working on it for a year or more than many years, yeah, that's right. right? Many years, maybe, maybe half their lifetime, mm -hmm. some of them. And they come here with all these ideas and then it's, it's not that um, people are kind of stopping their ideas. People are enhancing mm -hmm. things. People are saying, maybe you should, do, should think about doing this differently. You know, you may go down this path mm -hmm. and this may not work. Mm -hmm. So think about doing it. You know, and you're getting all these. And I, I've been sitting in some of the stations where maybe I'm offering some advice and feedback. And somebody else has a completely different perspective. Mm -hmm. And so these, and it, what's interesting is that these people with these projects, mm -hmm. they have to sort of like, take all this in and figure out where to go with it and what's nice is one of the facilitators are there to really try to organize all the thoughts together they've got tons of sticky notes right and um <laughs> yes. and trying to put all these things together but these people leave uh i felt like all of them left really energized mm -hmm. uh almost like wow like i uh i thought of, i didn't think about these 10 other things mm -hmm. or whatever it was that all these other people thought about also the connections right uh, peep, every single one of us there have connections mm -hmm. uh, in our own networks that we might be able to help uh, connect those people with. Maybe it's, oh, uh, I know somebody that does, you know, good social media that might help you with that. Or mm -hmm. I know somebody in, uh, you know, in a hospital that might help with this or, you know, whatever it is. Like, mm -hmm. so I think it's uh, really fascinating, but it's that collaborative process. And I think one of the great things that UFM helps uh, display and show through its practice, mm -hmm. uh, both in the classroom, but in the collab, in the Antigua form, and a lot of the projects mm -hmm. is this uh, collaborative process that's so important to innovation. And actually, I mean, that collaborative process that you were mentioning has some simple rules. I mean, learn to, to build up on the ideas of others. Yes. That means like saying yes and instead yeah. of yes, but. I mean, <laughs> these little things. Making your thinking visible. I mean, you are thinking things while you're hearing someone. Just make them visible in your post-its and share them with others. So that helps to having the thinking visible, it's easier to connect ideas or to validate or to expand or to build up on top of them. So I think it's very, very interesting. And we have used it in, at UFM to develop the, um, the curriculum of some of our programs. For example, the entrepreneurship program that we have in the undergraduate level, which was awarded last year as one of the best uh, entrepreneurship teaching programs in the world, in, with a, I, I can give you the details if you want to add it, by GCC, that is a consortium of entrepreneurship centers in the world. Um, he, one of the things that they mention is 
that the process that we use to build up the, the curriculum is the interesting part. So we have used these stations to build up the different areas of a curriculum. We, we use it for medicine, we use it for law, we use it for the uh, film school, uh, for this uh, entrepreneurship program. So we have used it for several projects and we keep doing it all the time because it's a very interesting way to combine great ideas from many people and different experiences. Well, there's so much talent here on the UFM campus. You, I mean, I just briefly mentioned the film school. You just mentioned it again. Uh, so when you do great projects like the Antigua Forum, you can take either current or graduates of the film school and employ them uh, yeah, to help amazing. you. And, yeah. and they are amazing. And, uh, and so it's, it's really great. Um, one of the last things I wanted to ask you, Monica, uh, because this, this goes a little bit more to you and your story mm -hmm. and the kind of, I also think, also think a testament to the kind of talent like you that UFM has here. Mm -hmm. uh, you were, in addition to many other things uh, that you do, I mean, I don't know how you do it all, a mother of two as well. <laughs> and uh, Happily married. <laughs> yes. Uh, you, are, you were a senior, or maybe you are, you still are a senior yep. consultant at a... Franklin Covey uh -huh. um, on issues of strategy and execution. Uh, since 1996, also, you were the co-author to Sean Covey's book, The Seven Habits of the Highly Effective College Students. Um, and so I think that builds off of uh, the previous book uh, that a lot of people know, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, mm -hmm. which is a, I mean, that is a globally well-known book. Yeah. I mean, everybody cites that book. <laughs> um, and, and so you then worked on The Seven Habits of Highly Effective College Students. You're the co-author of the book. Tell us a little bit about that project and how it how Oh, you got that involved. was an amazing experience. I have been with uh, Franklin Covey for many years, as you read. And uh, it has been a well, um, first of all, the, the, they have two different divisions. One division that is related with solutions for organizations. So that has helped me to be connected with many different uh, types of businesses in Guatemala and in the region. Because I started with them, I mean, being a consultant for the regions in so many years. So the process has been so interesting. And then sharing what I have learned uh, with the companies and then sharing with the students. I mean, it's a continuous. It is absolutely connected one thing with the other. And then they have this educational division, division which is trying to empower kids and young people r with leadership skills, which are so important today in the world. And so one, they do it uh, with, with, I mean, managers, but they do it with kids and young people. So then there was this initiative of doing a book that applies the seven habits to college students, which uh, was a very interesting process. It was more than a year that we were working with Sean and a team that was built up to do that. Everything was online. I mean, we didn't get together until the launch of the book, um, but we were connected all the time through different elements and tools that we have. And uh, the possibility to share examples from other countries that are not the US, for example. The possibilities to, to compare those skills that are needed everywhere the relevance of behavior in today's world and the importance of how you develop being a leader in whatever you choose to do in your life um, that can help you to succeed. I mean, is it has been an amazing experience. When was that book published? Uh, it was published a little bit before COVID. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I well, think it was like at the end of 2019 or at the beginning of 2020. Well, still very, very recent. I mean, obviously, yeah, you might have some other things post COVID, but the, <laughs> you know, I think what's important is the, the distraction students have these days with the smartphones and the social media mm -hmm. and everything like that and how you, how you kind of pay attention. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of enhancements those things bring as well, mm -hmm. but also the, uh, the distractions. And actually, you know, the book is mainly uh, digital. Mm. And it has incredible resources. Oh, the book has included the videos, the exercise, the links. The, I mean, so it's very interactive for students. You can even play and someone reads the book for you. I mean, it has a lot of technology included, which I think it's amazing because it's I, I, an evolution for, for new generations. So uh, I mentioned, so I actually have one more topic here for you because okay. it's a huge topic and I'm <laughs> sure you could talk for hours about it. Uh, and when I had my Fearless Journeys group trip here back in November to visit UFM, you gave a lunch discussion on this topic, the ripple effects of entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. which I believe was at your PhD thesis and it's just been some research you've developed. Can you tell us really the, uh, the nuts and bolts of the concept behind uh, the ripple effects of entrepreneurship. Yes, definitely. Yes, it was the thesis of my dissertation of the doctoral degree in economics, and my advisor was Peter Klein. 
And in the board, um, I have great people like Peter Betke, Virgil Store, I mean, Bob Lawson, which, which are like big economists in the world, and Helmut Chavez, who is from UFM. And uh, well, the topic is very interesting. And how we, I started this, I have been for so many years in contact with entrepreneurs and being related uh, with what they are doing and how people that are close to them admire them. And um, whenever you find in any research the impact that is generated by entrepreneurs, normally three variables appear. Employment generation, uh, contribution to GDP, and payment of taxes. And I get so angry <laughs> <laughs> when I see those three variables. I say, well, yes, but. Yes, but. <laughs> yes, but. <laughs> yes, and. <laughs> yes, and. <laughs> there is, in fact, in so many other ways. So that's how it started. One of the things is whenever you read not the Austrian economists, but other type of economists, you can see that they are talking of the means of production, but they, you don't find the entrepreneur when you read there. I mean, they're talking about capital or land and the people, the work, but you don't find the entrepreneur. I mean, so what I like is in Austrian economists, you see that the center of the whole market process is the entrepreneur. I mean, you can have land, workers, and capital, but if you don't have an entrepreneur that really makes that connection happen and move forward, it just doesn't happen. So to, to understand, as Mises defined, that the entrepreneur is the engine of growth, um, and show three variables as the impact of the engine of growth, I mean, it's impossible. So that's how it started. I decided to do this, do this qualitative uh, research with a big number of entrepreneurs. Uh, in different parts of the world. I use for some of them some researches that were done before and locally a lot of interviews with little entrepreneurs because I wanted to compare if the impact was similar, the big ones and the small ones. Maybe the wave they generate is of different size but the type of waves they generate are similar. So that's I started talking with many people and using many methodologies to do this. And uh, there were pretty much 12 areas of impact that was defined by people around the entrepreneur, not by him. It's by, I mean, the family, the workers, the clients, people that are their competitors, other members of the society where they live that have observed what he has been doing. And uh, I think, this increases my admiration for entrepreneurs. I really admire how brave uh, they are, how, um, how tough it is to move forward. And there are some societies that it, where it's even more difficult. <laughs> so um, I can mention some of them. And just trying to share this, I say, is like sharing a new lens. Where you can, which you can use to see an entrepreneur or, or entrepreneurial action. And that is whenever you look at a story of an entrepreneur, not just look for the numbers of employment and contribution to GDP and taxes, but for example, identify the new possibilities he has given to the clients. Thinking in small villages, for example, there's an entrepreneur that can bring to the, to the community cookies cookies that have never been sold before. I mean, just giving access to some products that would never have access before, or increase, increasing their productivity, or making simple or cheaper, I mean, some of these products and services. Um, changing the living standards, starting with his own family, but then changing the living standards for his employees or many people that are around them. Inviting others to invest in the area. I mean, if they are prosperous and they have been growing, that would attract interest to other investors or new companies or companies that are complement, have complementary products or competition. And I will, f I mean, there are many other areas, but I will end with one that was knowledge multipliers. I mean, the entrepreneurs need to learn new things in order to excel in their own entrepreneurial endeavor, but they have to teach it and share it with others. Otherwise, it won't help. So they have been identified by others as knowledge agents that are very important to society in order to move forward and increase in different ways their, their wellness and, and also their wealth, which is very important. So, I mean, this is part of the, the research. Yeah, and I know that we could talk for a long time about this. One of the th stories I want to mention was you, you gave this conversation talk to our group trip uh, when they were here in November. Mm -hmm. 
on on the ripple effects of entrepreneurship. You gave some great examples of how entrepreneurs uh, there are they basically have these ripple effects of people and that they don't maybe they don't even know they're having an effect on mm -hmm. maybe some of their neighbors mm -hmm. or other people in the community so the next day after we heard your talk well that day later that day we actually We're uh, leaving went, to, yeah. we left to go to lake atitlan uh -huh. and the next morning we did a, an experience in the village of San Juan La Laguna, uh -huh. where we went to Casa Florix Chaco, uh -huh. uh, which uh, Lisa Hankel uh, actually had introduced me to a few months earlier. So this was, as I think, my third visit, but the group's first visit. Mm -hmm. um, and the woman who uh, gives a lot of the demonstrations, her name is Delfina. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've met her. Mm -hmm. um, well, Delfina, uh, so this is a, this is a co-op uh -huh. uh, of indigenous women entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. and there's something like 37 of them. Mm -hmm. And she was giving the story mm -hmm. to our group about how they started. Well, the founder of this uh, co-op who just recently passed, she was an older woman, and, and she had this idea of, hey, uh, you know, a lot of people visit Lake Atitlan, and mm -hmm. they go to different villages, but in San Juan La Laguna, there's really not a lot of, there's no, like, attraction. Mm -hmm. It's a fine village to visit, but it's mostly a lot of locals, and there's nothing really to do here. So what if, um, you know, we have this co-op where we sell these products, what if we offered a demonstration? Mm -hmm. And by the way, they don't charge for the demonstration. People just come in. But of course, mm -hmm. they have a really nice gift shop mm -hmm. there. Uh, I mean, amazing fabrics, all sorts of things. What's really great, I've bought a number of things there for family <laughs> back home. They have the name and the picture of the woman mm -hmm. who uh, actually created the, uh, the exact product mm -hmm. that you have. And then they usually put a time of how mm -hmm. long it took. So most of the products, like maybe a table runner or a scarf or something, um, it took like two weeks to make handmade. These are all handmade products. Mm -hmm. Um, and you get to see sort of a demonstration of how some of those products are made. You maybe some of your group might even participate, mm -hmm. uh, in that demonstration as well. Anyway, as she's telling the story, she said, yeah, you know, so w once we created this, uh, w then it allows all these women in the area to make products and have their products sold here. Mm -hmm. And the demonstration brings more tourists here, mm -hmm. just such as we were there on that day. So there's something going on there, and then we have been able to sell more products, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and they take a percentage from what the women sell there as, uh, as all that. She said, well, you know what's really interesting? And by the way, she didn't know about your thesis of ripple effects of entrepreneurship. She said, you know, really interesting is uh, somewhat recently, um, there's a gentleman down the street that saw what we were doing. And now, and he has a chocolate shop, and now he's doing uh, chocolate demonstrations, mm -hmm. how to make chocolate. And people are coming there. And I little light bulb went off in my head, and I said, "Oh my gosh, this was what Monica was talking about yesterday." The ripple of, and, she, and by the way, you know I mean they had no, they didn't tell this person to start this chocolate demonstration. It was just the person saw, mm -hmm. people are going there because there's a demonstration, and they're buying more stuff. Maybe I can do a demonstration with my chocolate, and they'll come here and buy some more chocolate products, and 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 then you're starting to see more things pop up in San Juan La Laguna. I mean. I've noticed on some of the Guatemala Instagram accounts that there's all these murals that people are visiting now. There's some lookout points that have been recently built. So I'm thinking, wow, this is really just a ripple effect uh, that some entrepreneurs had an impact on. And now you're seeing a community thrive and more and more people. And by the way, that day that we went, we got off the boat, right? We, ha we paid a boat to take us there, right? We then, uh, some of us walked and some of us took tuk-tuks. Mm -hmm. Uh, up so those tuk-tuk drivers mm -hmm. are now getting paid because more people are coming right so this is i mean i could just continue and also you know maybe me as the person offering a group trip to guatemala one of the features i'm saying is hey we're going to have a textile demonstration right so i mean th that helps my business too and an attraction of why may more people might come to guatemala on my trip so you could just keep going down these ripple effects monica so Absolutely. i really you really opened my mind that day when we had that and i'm working on a book right now on entrepreneurship because i've had a lot of conversations with people like you and other entrepreneurs uh for the last seven years and so you're thinking uh, is definitely going to impact the way I'm approaching, you know, as I finish my book, uh, because I see all these entrepreneurs having, you know, ripple effects in the in the people in their own lives and community. So I just want to thank you for all your work on that and for all you do at UFM. And uh, maybe I'll give you some last words here to uh, to close us out. Well, thank you so much. I mean, it's a great opportunity. Always it's a great opportunity to talk with you and share some of these experiences and stories. And I think that the purpose of something like the ripple effect is uh, 
remembering how important it is to observe things that are happening without any planification is just like natural in the environment. And if people are free to create new things, how others observing can learn and just replicate or make little changes and And entrepreneurship is like that. It's like magic in a way. So uh, I think that uh, any one of us has the opportunity to have specific projects that you can address uh, entrepreneurially. And also the relevance of connecting with others, of serving uh, whatever you are helping others to do just because of what you are doing. And always be connected with what is your passion. So I think that all these things are visible in the many different things that we talked today. I mean, how important was the passion for the founders of UFN or the passion for someone like us doing this research or understanding what they do or doing any of the projects of Antigua Forum? The passion is a very important component. And living a life without passion or without a very specific dream or project or something that you can really do can be totally a different way of living life. So just, um, I'm so happy to be here with you and anytime uh, we can continue this conversation and hope that anyone that is seeing the podcast get also inspired and can move forward in their own dreams, passion and uh, endeavors that you are doing. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Monica. And you know, uh, one last thing I'll say is, you know, I think UFM has 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 had its own ripple effects uh, here in Guatemala for all the students that have been involved, all the observers, all the people I mentioned that I meet around town, around the country that know about UFM, know what it stands for, uh, are inspired by it. All the people that have come here uh, from around the world. Uh, I've been here during a very monumental time for UFM. It's 50th anniversary. Seeing people come in from all over the world, the U.S. Uh, to to celebrate the success of UFM over 50 years, the Antigua Forum, all these sorts of things. So it's really been great. And I hope by maybe spreading this podcast to some of the viewers and listeners, maybe around Guatemala, but maybe also in the U.S., that maybe UFM will have some ripple effects in the United States. And we'll, we'll learn that this is possible, a place of freedom and entrepreneurship and, and really... I think at the core of it all, like you said, human activity and human action is the entrepreneur. And so if we can have a, a institutions like UFM, more institutions like this, whether they be in Guatemala, the U.S., other places in the world uh, that can inspire an entrepreneurial mindset, um, I think that the more the merrier. So, Monica, thank you so much for being an agent of innovation and being on the Agents of Innovation podcast. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Awesome. All right. Great. Okay, so the Agents of Innovation podcast continues to explore this amazing Universidad Francisco Marroquin, and we're here with an alum and a current member of the mm -hmm. staff, Isabel Moigno. So Isa, mm -hmm. welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yes, and thanks for your time. We're, we're, we're here on the Rose Friedman Plaza, and um, it's a beautiful day in the eternal mm -hmm. spring. And uh, Isa, you um, are from Guatemala City, and... What's interesting, you graduated from UFM in 2016. You're now the project manager of the CoLab, which mm -hmm. is sort of short for collaboration, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. But what I want to go back to is a little bit of your story of being part of this community at UFM. Mm -hmm. uh, did you, by the way, did you have any family members that went to UFM by any chance? Or your parents Not didn't go really, here? Not really, no, no. no. So uh, tell us, when you were approaching the idea of going to college mm -hmm. where did you want to go yeah that's a, a good question so my dad always encouraged me and my sisters to uh, live abroad and i wanted to specifically study in a latin america city that was an example for for latin america and i thought well maybe that city is chile uh, yeah, well, right now it's not <laughs> an example anymore, uh, I guess. Uh, should have gone to Chile, but <laughs> right. they would have had not so, so much socialism going on there. Right, so, um, well, that's, that's this, uh, I wanted to go to Universidad Católica de Chile, and, you know, it was mostly because of the experience. Uh, my dad has always pushed us to think beyond uh, and expand our perspective, um, travel a lot we always learn different languages i totally agree with your dad i think that <laughs> i i encourage travel as well one of the things i started with my fearless journeys community mm -hmm. is a travel component because i think traveling helps 
you expand your horizons mm-hmm. and here I am uh, completing about a year of living in Guatemala. Yeah. So that's something I, I, I tell people do this when you're younger, though. I wish I could have done this 20 years ago. Um, but I have, you know, I think uh, I've traveled about 24 countries now wow. in my life. So I think, um, uh, you know, getting out and traveling is great. And, and again, I encourage it. And we're doing some group trips, including here to Guatemala. So, so yeah, so uh, your dad encourages travel. So you're thinking right. I might study abroad or live mm-hmm. abroad. Yeah, so, well, we showed up to Universidad Católica. I did the admission in test Chile. in Chile. And the exam was super hard. And it only had questions around Chile and, like, very specific questions for, like, people mm. from there. And, of course, I didn't pass the test. And I knew it. I mean, I couldn't answer almost any of it. So, um so I decided, so the, the process was you pass the test and then you get an interview with the dean. And so I tried calling the dean because, of course, I didn't pass the test. And I was super sad about it because I didn't want to come back to Guatemala and say, hey, I lost the exam. Um, I've always been a good student. So it was like sort of like a um, ego uh, yeah, blow, like a <laughs> thing, yeah. right? So um, anyways, I talked to the dean and then she was... Um, you know, reviewing my profile and saying like, hey, you're, you're a great candidate, but we cannot skip the process admission. I'm sorry that the exam wasn't made for foreigners. That's something we need to work on. But right now, like, I, I cannot think of anything else. And then she told me, but why are you thinking coming here when you have the most beautiful campus uh, in Latin America in Guatemala? Uh, and I was like, what, which campus are you talking about? <laughs> and of course, I knew about UFM. Um, and so she told me, well, UFM, it has a magnificent campus. We actually have a collaboration with them. You can go to UFM, study one year their journalism, and come back with us. And so I came back to Guatemala. I had an interview with uh, Santiago Fernandez, who is now the, the dean of the International School of Political Relations at UFM. And yeah, I started my journey at UFM as a student. So it's interesting. I mean, I think that's also a testimony to the international connections and reputation that UFM has Mm -hmm. all the way in Chile. Someone was telling you, why are you coming here? Just go to UFM. Um, But UFM is not an easy school to get into here Mm -hmm. either. Um, And and so uh, how was that process for you? You said you had an interview with Mm -hmm. um, somebody who's now the dean uh, of one of the schools, but... Uh, what was the process of applying to UFM? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, we usually take a, a general exam test, sort of SAT, uh, but, you know, made for Guatemalan. It's called PAA. And I already had taken that in school because it was a requirement. I already passed it. And then TOEFL, I already passed it. So for me, it was, you know, a seamless um, entry, let's you say. Had, you had the requirement. You had met right. the standards that UFM might expect. Right. And then... And I also met the standards for the interview and a specific test they took at EPRI. So I, that's how I joined uh, in 2011, uh, journalism at EPRI. So what was your uh, evolution as a student? You started mm-hmm. as a journalism uh, major. Mm-hmm. And uh, how, did you, how did you go through college? Yeah. So and, it, I, and it I take it you didn't go to Chile. Yeah, right. You, know, you didn't do <laughs> that one here. year to go to Chile, <laughs> yes. So I, uh, well, to be honest, the first year at UFM, I thought it was going to be temporary. I wasn't expecting to stay at UFM. Uh, My idea was always to, okay, I'll do one year and then I'll go back to Chile. And also my best friend uh, ended up staying in Chile. So that was like uh, something that we had agreed on. Anyways, um, I remember the first semester uh, being a, a, a student at UFM. We had one class called the freshman experience. And it was a transformative experience to me uh, because the teacher was, you know, sitting there. He projected a quote that said, as a public school teacher, uh, I'm used to teach others the habit of dependency. Uh, People, you know, are to expect people better train than themselves to tell them what to do. And he only had that quote there. Mm. Uh, And he didn't, you know, the usual thing to wait as a student was to get the teacher to tell us what to do. (laughs) I mean, that's the norm, right? Uh, Everywhere. And so he was just there waiting for us. And then it hit to me like, oh no, I am waiting for him to, you know, tell me what to do because I think he's better trained than me. And so that's that's a pivotal moment. 
personally because there there through that class I learned about freedom and responsibility and how to take learning in my own hands being owner of my own learning experience so um, after that that was the seed class that took us to another experimental class student run uh, we it was economics Austrian economics and it was completely student run uh, we were free to design the course as we wanted and the only requirement was that we needed to pass the test that everyone else at UFM had to pass and we passed it and and then I couldn't go back to traditional learning and <laughs> I and that's how I enrolled in the into the MPC once we had like a good group of people uh, we would meet in the library at UFM's library to plan how this you know program like genuine learning will take place and so when you yeah. said MPC that's mm -hmm. the Michael Polanyi College right right yeah um, but that didn't exist when you started as a student and my understanding is mm -hmm. you as one of the students were uh, one of the pioneers of the Michael Polanyi College tell us uh, how how the students came up with the idea that ended up becoming Michael Planty College and then what's unique about that college that stands yeah. out? Uh, well, it was, I think it was an idea, it was a s an idea that had already been taking place. Giancarlo Ibarguen, um, former president of UFM, uh, he, he envisioned a place where true dialogue and genuine learning would take place. So, there was a momentum uh, for the MPC, I mean, there, to, to be born. Um, of course, they needed students to, you know, that would take on the challenge. Initially, we wouldn't know, I mean, I, I didn't know if I, what, what, uh, what degree I was going to have or um, th how the classes would look like or who the teachers would be like. I, I, have, I had no idea. And it was a, it was a call, call to adventure or for adventure. And um, I remember, I, so I was in journalism and I had to drop out of journalism, which would, you know, guarantee me in a way of a, a, a formal degree. Mm. Yeah, so it's interesting because there's a lot of students here that um, can now design their own majors, mm -hmm. right? And, and you and some other students designed an entire college. Yes. Right, within the university. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that was definitely experimental. Um, you mentioned the pr one of the previous presidents, Juan mm -hmm. Carlos, mm -hmm. uh, Giancarlo. who had ha mm -hmm. uh, John Carlo, mm -hmm. who had the um, uh, I kind of the idea. Like you said, there was some momentum, mm -hmm. but it needed students. So was this was this also a student initiative, or were the students kind of picking up um, the baton, mm -hmm. as you will, uh, for for an idea that was visioned by someone else? Right. I, I think it was a mix of both. So all the students had a deep commitment with genuine learning and um, just trying basically freedom in education. Like, because of course there's a lot of freedom, but with that, with that, it also comes a lot of responsibility and accountability. Yeah. Um. So I, I guess it's a it's a mix of both. The idea was there. The students were there. Students were asking for more of it. So once we had, you know, a um, significant mass of students, uh, we went ahead with the program. And I remember exactly uh, when I received the letter uh, where UFM was inviting me to be part of this pioneering class. And I was still in the, in the decision of should I go to Chile or should I stay in Guatemala? And then I just, you know, said to myself, probably I wouldn't get this experience in Chile. Yeah, like there's no chance I would co-create uh, with someone else uh, program, uh, my, my own learning experience. So I chose to stay at UFM. So that's great. So you guys have now left a legacy for all the other students. The, um, what year approximately was the Michael Plenty College officially established? Do you remember? 2012. 2012. Mm -hmm. And then you graduated in 2016 from right. the Michael Plenty College? Yes. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. So, hey, I'm going to a university. I'm going to start our, our own mm -hmm. college, and we're going to graduate from that college. So that's <laughs> great. Um, so also, um, one of the things, so 
tell me uh, when you graduated from the university what was your degree mm-hmm. okay so my degree was uh we all major in liberal arts so my liberal degree arts? my degree was liberal arts and my concentration um is creative and expository writing so at MPC, you don't see that everywhere. <laughs> Creative and expository writing. Right. Did you come up with that? No, Lisa helped me. Lisa Henkel. L- yes. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so, well, the the interesting thing about the MPC is that we all majored in liberal arts, but everyone has a different concentration, uh, and that's where. So the first years are, you know, we learn together. We learn biology, physics. Uh, Euclid, <laughs> geometry, uh, you know, the great books. And then the the last part of the program, you design your own learning contracts with the mentors who you want to choose. Mm-hmm. So uh, MPC gave, gives the freedom to students to actually choose their mentors. For example, Giancarlo was a mentor to me uh, for two courses. And, you know, you wouldn't think... I had basically one-on-one sessions with UFM's president at the moment, and you don't get to see that in in every university. Yeah, no, that's really special here. Um, Well, the other thing is, so you graduated in 2016. What Mm -hmm. was your first career or role or job outside of uh, of being a student? Yeah, Um, and that's another interesting story. So everyone, my friends and family just thought, you know, probably you won't get a job offer after you graduate from MPC because what's liberal arts? That's (laughs) like so new in Guatemala. Mm. Uh, But at the time I had three job offers and something that I didn't mention, but I think it's very important um, is that I fell in love with UFM's mission. Once I understood what UFM stands for, that was definitely a major... um, thing that also motivated me to work in this place and be part of this community, um, beca- you know, the mission. And so um, I actually started working with Lisa Hankel. Um, I, worked, uh, I worked at the development office at UFM. Great, so, so development mm-hmm. fundraising uh, with, yeah. l- with Lisa Hankel, the yeah. legend. Right. <laughs> 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 uh, so I would, you know, write thank you letters to donors, proposals, reports. I mean, I would do a lot of writing. And would you yeah. say you would do creative and expository writing? Mostly expository, <laughs> but uh, well, it's also a mix of creative, though. Um, it, it was a mix. That's yeah. good. So you did that. How long were you working in the development department at UFM? I worked there for three years. Three years, mm-hmm. and then what was your next uh, role? My next grade. Ad- well, so, um, I always want. I, I I always wanted to do an MBA. And I knew the MBA that I wanted to pursue. MBA. 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 Yeah. Okay. MBA. And there's is this the Acton MBA program? Right. Yeah. Here at yeah. UFM. Well, it's a funny story. I mean, it's also an interesting story. Um, so well, I. You was didn't design the Acton MBA. No, I did didn't. Okay. <laughs> That's on Jeff Sandifer. Okay. <laughs> um, so well, initially I was going to stay here at UFM. Um, uh, but I always, uh, I mean, since I didn't leave Guatemala, I was always curious to live somewhere else. But but again, after I like looked through all the programs uh, out there, I realized that the Acton program was the best for me because, again, it puts you in the driver's seat of your education. Um, you get out what you put into it. And so... Um, it's funny because I was already accepted in the in the Guatemalan program, but then Lisa again, she sent me an email about this Jordan Peterson fellowship that the Acton MBA was doing. That was in 2019, and so it was a big call for audition. Uh, they were, you know, expecting an international group of students, and so I just said, you know, I'll I'll just apply and see what happens because maybe I can do this experience in the U.S. And that's what I wanted originally. Where did it take place in the U.S.? In Austin. Was Jordan Peterson there himself? No, he never showed up. <laughs> Jordan Peterson, where are you? <laughs> yes. You didn't show up for your own fellowship? <laughs> Why was it named the Jordan Peterson Fellowship? So the idea was to, um, you know, have him as an as a like more a active, professor, yeah, like a professor or visiting like a professor. It was mostly that. I but see he's actually starting to do something at some new small college in Savannah. Yeah, um, I forget the name of it, but I just I just heard this recently, mm-hmm. uh, sort of like a visiting professor. So maybe this was kind of the idea. But 
Uh, but he was supposed to be kind of there as almost like a visiting yes. professor, discussion leader type thing. In some, yeah, in yeah. some ways, I guess we didn't, uh, we never had clear what his role would be. Um, but you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, he had some personal things going on, yeah. so he he couldn't make. What it. year was this? Twenty nineteen. Twenty nineteen. Yeah, I think he was starting to have some health issues. Right. Okay, so right. that might have been it. Yeah. Sorry, Jordan. <laughs> yes. Um, but it was a great experience. So uh, the program was six months online and six months in Austin. It was wow. the most intense thing I've ever done in my life. Basically, it's like being an entrepreneur without being it. <laughs> and that's the whole idea. It's like a simulator for for how, you know, uh, life of the entrepreneur looks like. Interesting. Yeah. And so in the program... Uh, was Jeff Sandifer involved? Yes, yes. Was this... So Jordan Peterson Fellowship, was it connected to the act in MBA right yeah okay right yeah and Jeff uh, you know he teaches he would you know uh, facilitate the case discussions at the act in MBA that's great well mm -hmm. um, there's an act in MBA here at mm -hmm. UFM I know people that are like in business now take it like they come back mm -hmm. as um, you know active participants uh, so and and obviously there's a lot of uh, people in um, business who also come in as like visiting professors, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. So it's a really fantastic program and has a very strong reputation. Do you know how long that program has been around in Guatemala at UFM? Mm, that's a good question. I'm not sure, but definitely more between eight years. Yeah, because I, I, yeah, I feel like the way people talk about it, like they must have known about it for a while. Like I hear yeah. people when I meet people, you know, in Guatemala, maybe they've done it or they, they mm -hmm. want to do it or they've heard about it or they just mention it as like yeah. a program that they've heard about. So that's great. So um, so you did that. You went to Austin for six months. You did online mm -hmm. from Guatemala, mm -hmm. I suppose, mm -hmm. for six months. That's 2019. Right. And um, and then what's your next role here in right. UFM? Um, so something I loved about the Acton MBA program is that um, Jeff started developing a thing called the Next Great Adventure. And so before graduation, we were to define what our next great adventure would be. And there's a methodology here at UFM that I'm really passionate about, which is the co-creation methodology that you've seen in Antigua Forum. Yeah. Um, and that's been around for a little while now. And Antigua right. Forum has been around about a decade or so. A decade, yeah. Yeah. And that's also, well, that's also a major uh, project that Giancarlo Ivarguen envisioned. And so I've... I love this methodology and I like I love sharing it with others and so I thought you know if I come back to UFM I want to have a more active role on pushing forward the methodology sharing it with others and I just fell in love with collaboration <laughs> if that makes sense that's great yeah well you know uh, as you know I teach a class here uh, the last year I've taught three different semesters of students on entrepreneurship and innovation and one of the key components we always talk about is collaboration, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, and, and there's so many examples of this. And the more I've taught it, mm -hmm. the more I see it, like in practice when I'm talking to entrepreneurs or, or seeing things. And then, of course, um, you know, I walk through this beautiful campus and there's a really nice room kind of in the bottom part of the center of the academic building. Um, that's the co-lab. You know, uh, short for collaboration. Yes. So was this your next big adventure? Right, <laughs> right. So I came back to UFM. Of course, the pandemic hit. and um, But fortunately, the collab um, project was launching. And so I was able, you know, I was able to join the, pro the project. Um, basically, what we do at the collab, um, we focus in taking the ideas of freedom to action and the idea is well we offer interdisciplinary learning experiences uh, for students from different you know disciplines at UFM to work on developing solutions or prototypes for solutions to real social challenges um, so it's very hands-on very active um, it's basically I mean you we have uh, each you know course or collab has a group of facilitators but they mostly focus on facilitate the innovation process uh, rather than, you know, traditional learning or content based learning. So, for example, we have uh, we've had one around malnutrition in Guatemala, some others about fintech, how to include technology in finance. 
uh, also K-12 economics, which Monica teaches right now, facilitates at the collab. So these are courses that students can take within the collab. Right. And the students in any particular class could come from a variety of, of, of majors and disciplines. Exactly. Yeah. So, so how they can how kind of learn what from their different perspectives. Right. And that's the whole idea. And that's something that um, I really appreciated from the MPC. So the first group of pioneers, we were all coming from different schools. The Michael uh, Polanyi College, right. MPC, yeah. Yeah, for, from different schools uh, within UFM, uh, for example. I mean, I was from EPRI, some other people were for, from, you know, economics, uh, business administration. or So it's, it feels like, for me, it, feel, it feels like coming full circle into facilitating these experiences for others, for other students at UFM. That's fantastic. And the collab, my also understanding, so there's courses within there. Right. I've also seen, I think you guys do something, if, I, uh, if I'm not, t correct me if I'm wrong, um, maybe on Fridays, is there some kind of special gathering there? Mm, so probably uh, the courses. I mean, Those the collab the is always full okay. on Fridays because we have courses. So, uh, well, as you know, students at UFM are required to take um the pillars of ethics of liberty and economics. Mm -hmm. So Liberty in Action, which is a project from the collab, um, has also been added to that um, core curriculum, let's okay. say. And so uh, how it works is we give students uh, free, free freedom of choice. So we usually do, we launch with a pitch day. For example, right now we have 16 collabs um, wow. active. And students get to choose their top three and then they get assigned to one of their top three so when you say uh 16 collabs mm -hmm. um like w one collab could be one taught by monica on k-12 economics right. and then somebody else is teaching and and is that a w oh, that's not just like a that's like a full semester that's a full semester yeah, yeah. so they're getting like course credit right for that and right. then my other understanding with the collab some things i've learned is you've partnered with outside entities, maybe some international institutions or organizations. Um, I understand maybe MIT was part of one of them. Can you just talk mm -hmm. about some of those international yeah. types of uh, partnerships you might have? Absolutely. So um, a recent one was we partner with the University of Texas in Austin with Robin Metcalf. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So Rob Metcalf. Yeah. He's the guy that created the Ethernet, right? Yeah, she's the wife of the guy who created oh, wha the. Oh, wha yeah. what was her name? Robin. Oh, Robin. Okay, right, I right, thought right. I thought you said Bob. So no, Bob. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, Robin, Robin Metcalf. Right, right. Wife right. of the creator of the Ethernet. Yes, she's amazing. Yeah. And so we launched a collab uh, in partnership with UT. Um, so and she's a professor there. She's a professor there. Okay. And she facilitated this course with Stephanie Olaños, who is a teacher at UFM and also an alum. Um, and the course was around global food systems design, so how to include freedom and, you know, create a better understanding of the global food systems. Mm. And it was a very interesting experience for students, you know, both from UT and from UFM because of the international component uh, and how different things are in each country, right? That's one. The other uh, partnership we've managed at the collab is... Well, as you as you might know, UFM is part of the Make Impact Consortium, and basically, it's a consortium formed by international universities. Uh, there's MIT there, Texas A&M, and some others in different continents, and UFM is part of it. So uh, they launched. They have launched ch challenges open to every student from every uh, university member, and there was one. That's called. Uh, that was called Omni Omni Hotels. Omni COVID Hotels. Challenge. Yeah. yeah. Challenge. So the idea was to innovate in how to prevent the spread of COVID uh, in hotels, specifically in Omni Hotels. And we had a group of UFM students. It was interdisciplinary because they've learned from a previous challenge, at, uh, you know, uh, offered by the MIT, MIC that the interdisciplinary component was key to their success. So they chose, they actively chose to form an interdisciplinary group. I mean, it was on purpose. And they won second place. And let me ask mm -hmm. you, because they're coming up with a solution in the pandemic. Right. Were they doing this over Zoom? Yes. 
Yeah. So yeah. This, normally the collab is a really cool space mm-hmm. with project boards, little sticky notes everywhere. Um, was there someone on your end at the collab? With a project board with sticky notes <laughs> on the Zoom call? Yes. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that, that was the main challenge of the collab that we had to launch in Zoom or, yeah. you know, uh, online. Uh, we learned tons about different online tools and we've learned that, you know, we can do collabs online. Um, so we would use tools like Mural, which is a digital whiteboard with tons of post-its and stuff, mm. Zoom and Slack and other ways to interact. It was definitely harder than in-person collaboration. Yes. Right now that we have in-person collaboration, students, you know, it's it's easier to break the ice between yeah. students that you don't know. Oh yeah, especially if you don't mm-hmm. know other students. Yeah. Um. So that's great. So you so uh, UFM students uh, through the uh, joined together, I guess through the collab to participate in this international competition. Uh, at Omni Hotels mm-hmm. Health Challenge, I guess, whatever it was called. Omni Hotels Post-COVID Challenge. Post-COVID mm-hmm. Challenge. And and how did the students do? They did great. So they won second place. Wow. And they also won Best Media Documentation Award. So they Best were... Best Media Communication? Documentation. 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 Yeah, right. Oh, wow. Yeah. So what did that involve? That involved, um, you know, documenting, making videos, reels of their work, um, showing you know, how, how they collaborated, mm. um, you know, remotely. And sometimes they would gather at UFM because they were only four with masks and all of the, you know, necessary things for social distancing. So let me ask you something, knowing that, th- that this was interdisciplinary with students from a variety of mm-hmm. backgrounds, did that project include students from the UFM film school? I, well, for th- that time, I think they didn't include um, students from film school, although we encouraged it because, uh, you know, they are. I was just the wondering because <laughs> you said they won the media documentation <laughs> yes, yes. award that maybe maybe some film students were involved. Yes, no, no, they weren't. Um, but yeah, we would love to have them involved. Well, yeah. there's a lot of talent here at UFM. Um, you know, for those that have been watching some of the Agents of Innovation podcast interviews from my Guatemala series, you know, I picked off some talent from my own classroom. Uh, my, my student here, Luis Da, Luis David Lopez, <laughs> uh, who's behind the camera over there. <laughs> and, uh, and so anyway, he's not even in the film school, but does really great film work, oh, wow. I learned. And so it's actually kind of interesting how you can get people with a lot of different backgrounds, um, like Luis, uh, who you know, have, have all this talent. They're doing all these entrepreneurial things on the side mm-hmm. uh, while they're students. Um, so, that, so that's uh, uh, really great. But yeah, so I, 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 you know, we're going to have on a, another episode here some students uh, some alums of the university, mm-hmm. young students who created um, some tech companies here in Guatemala and are still emerging. And so it's uh, really great. But I think uh, a lot of the things that you're doing mm-hmm. uh, to help students have this really amazing experience collaborating across disciplines through colleges, creating colleges, creating majors. Mm-hmm. So it's really exciting. And then I know that you're, you've also been one of the facilitators at the Antigua mm-hmm. Forum. Have you been doing that for a while? Yes, uh, since I, I so I took the first training when while I was a student at mm. MPC, and I've been doing that ever since. And we also learned how to do it online in the pandemic. So oh, cause we already tested was it. Was one online. of the Antigua forums online, or they no, all they no, all were in person? They right? were all in person, but there were some events. So um, now we're getting more traction from yes. international. So Antigua yeah. Forum, um, like you said, it's become. Um, a lot of people that have been involved, some of them are pretty reputable people that come from a variety mm-hmm. of backgrounds, think tanks, uh, businesses, all sorts of things all around the world. My understanding is um, an organization I'm very familiar with back in the United States, State Policy Network, mm-hmm. uh, asked UFM and the Antigua Forum uh, that UFM runs uh, to basically have, what was the name of the project that, that UFM helped them start? Um, Launchpad. Launchpad, yeah. Launchpad? So State Policy Network Launchpad. Yeah. Can, do you know, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So when that happened, I was doing the act on MBA. So I ah. wasn't like really an active part of it, but I know that SPN um, sort of... You were not an active part of it. No, no okay. but I know that that collaboration opened the... Um, the world of UFM in the sense that more international organizations were reaching out. Mm. So we've worked with Texas A&M uh, and other foundations uh, that are, you know, part of the Liberty Movement. Like the Texas Public Policy uh, Foundation right, yeah, right. in Austin. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and, and I, I actually once worked for one of those organizations, the James Madison Institute mm. in Florida. So, And I know SPN, for those that aren't familiar, State Policy Network is a consortium, if you will, of free market state-based think tanks mm -hmm. uh, in all the different 50 states in the United States. And so that one of the things they try to do is provide them with resources, ways to grow, ways to improve. And uh, I suppose, you know, I know some people from SPN that work at SPN have come and be, been a part of the um, Antigua Forum and some of the th state think tank leaders um, have been a part of the Antigua Forum as well. So uh, so their their interaction with Antigua Forum and UFM yeah. to help create launch pads so that they could kind of have that co-creative process for think tanks right. to learn. And, and believe me, the think tanks need it, right? Because <laughs> yes. uh, think tanks mostly attract a lot of policy people, mm -hmm. uh, maybe people that have a certain uh, viewpoint or perspective and they, they need to collaborate with others to learn how to grow and to take their message uh, more effectively to other people that may not share their, mm -hmm. their same ideas or values or even uh, with the different kinds of people they interact with. They interact with media, they interact with legislators, they interact with the public. Yeah. So it's, it's all about how do you educate in different ways. And, and so anyway, uh, yeah, so that's, that's really cool that you, you've, mm -hmm. the, what you've started here though with Michael Planning College and then the CoLab, you've been a part of starting that. Um, it's really been uh, great. And then can you tell me about your, your uh, colleague um, in the CoLab? Uh, mm, yes. Who, who also, uh, I think he, he did a program in mm -hmm. Stanford or yes, somewhere out there. Yes, yes, So Jorge Ariel Jimenez is his name. And uh, he graduated from the law school here at UFM. And then he went off to Stanford and he did a master's there. And he also worked as a fellow uh, in the D school and a fellow for legal design in the D school. And he worked there, I, I think he lived there for about two or three years, if I'm correct. And that's where Gabriel Calza, former UFM president, tracked him down to tell him like, hey, we would love to, you know, um, hear your lessons learned and have them, you know, in the collab in Guatemala. And that's how he ended up coming back um, to Guatemala. And he's definitely, you know, shared a lot of his insights into, you know, pushing and launching the, the collab project. That's great. I, my, my, also, my understanding is also that some students from UFM have gone to places in Silicon Valley and others and have competed and yeah. taken part in projects and things like that. So it's, it was really fascinating hearing this because I don't think a lot of people outside Guatemala know about UFM and it's mm -hmm. an incredible institution, 50 years now. There's certainly people who have, right? People in that state think tank movement maybe who can became on the Antigua Forum, a lot of people that are involved mm -hmm. with Antigua Forum. Um, there's people in the Liberty Movement internationally, certainly are very familiar with, uh, with UFM. Um, but what's interesting is these partners, then when I came here to UFM and to learn more and then to, mm -hmm. to be a visiting professor uh, and speaking and learning about all these different programs that are internal, like the CoLab, and I just love, because when I walk by, mm -hmm. I just like get a, I just like see the students over yeah. there and they're in their little co-creation groups <laughs> and they're just really excited and yeah. energized about entrepreneurship and like, wow, you just don't see this anywhere. And I don't know that people really have an idea that this goes on here. Um, but then to hear from, from, from you all that, you know, there are these partnerships, international partnerships with, that have been started by entities like MIT or, uh, you know, Texas A&M and uh, mm -hmm. Jeff Sandifer the, with the Acton MBA and like all these sorts of things. And that actually there is some real international acclaim yeah. in certain spots uh, with people doing really cool, like collaborative work and, um, you know, you and, and many others here at UFM are responsible for, for taking that and giving UFM, um, you know, a platform of giving UFM students access and interactive activities. So young people here in Guatemala, if they're so lucky to be able to come to UFM, don't have to go to other countries right. for <laughs> education. They don't have to go to Chile. You're, I mean, you're an example mm -hmm. of, I wanted to go here. It didn't work out for a specific reason. Uh, had to look back internally at Guatemala see this incredible institution i'll mm -hmm. go there for a year so that i could get my credentials to go to chile oh by the way i no longer want to go to chile because yeah. this place is amazing right yeah so i think yeah. you're just a really great example of that isa and uh, it's been great getting to know you during my Thank last you. year here and seeing all the great work you're doing around campus like i said you've, you've been a student you've helped start a launch a college as as part of the student group that did that um you've now you've worked in the development department mm -hmm. helping ufm acquire some some private funding 
and then um, you, uh, you you then are now part of the co-op. So we'll have to see. You're still very young, and, <laughs> yes. uh, and hopefully, uh, what's also very interesting to me is how many people that work here on the staff, whether they're professors or different uh, roles like yours, uh, are graduates of UFM and have been part of the community and want to continue being part of it. So I'm going to just give you kind of the last word here about uh, what I, I, I know you've kind of mentioned this a little bit, but what do you, what has it been like to be part of this community as a mm -hmm. student and an employee in a sense mm -hmm. um, and as a as a facilitator and create maybe an educator in some ways um, and then what do you see the future of this institution mm -hmm. yeah well thank you uh, first of all thank you for the space uh, it's been a really interesting conversation and it's been quite a journey um, in many ways I mean personally it has impacted my life beyond I thought you know going to school uh would have um it it's definitely opened me doors with international um people and you know local people what i love about ufm is this culture or this entrepreneurial attitude to always be in the lookout of how how might we be more innovative or how might we be different how might we do communicate our mission better so UFM's culture is one of constantly being the lookout of um, excellence and being better and delivering in better ways, taking into account its users. So what I'm thrilled about UFM is that I know that it's not a static you know, institution, but it's always dynamic, looking for, for what's new. And... Processes like Antigua Forum or the CoLab or the MPC, I think, are a reflection of how innovative UFM is. And I think that's a lot in part of having entrepreneurs as trustees, uh, entrepreneurs as founders, and this mentality of, you know, let's prototype, test. If it fails, we can do another thing. And if it doesn't, let's push forward. So I know for sure that UFM will continue to have this spirit in the years to come. Well, great. Well, it's been great being part of this community, and um, and I think that spirit is something really emblematic. You see it pervasive throughout many different professors and different people that, that work here, so I think you're right. And then when you bring all those kind of innovative minds together, people keep pushing and they mm -hmm. keep innovating. And so I just want to say thank you for being an agent of innovation here at UFM and in Guatemala, and, uh, and thanks for being on the Innov Agents of Innovation podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco.